this project from Kairos Canada is funded by the Government of Canada's Temporary Foreign Worker Program. My name is David Ivany. I am part of the Empowering Temporary Foreign Workers team, uh, and I'm honored to facilitate this webinar today. So welcome, everyone. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that we are meeting today on the traditional territories of the Indigenous people across Turtle Island. We thank them for allowing us to meet and learn together on their territories. To the original caretakers of this land of which we stand, I acknowledge the land of the Huron-Wendat, Patoon, Seneca, and most recently the Mississaugas of the Credit Indigenous Peoples where I am right now. To all that were here for thousands of years before us across Turtle Island, we honor the struggles and lives of those who gave themselves for it. For those here today, we acknowledge the ancestors. Beneath our feet, we acknowledge the land. Our ears to the ground, we can hear them. The Cree, the Métis, the Diné, the Soto, and Anishinaabe, the Dakota and Lakota nations, the Inuit, the Blackfoot, the Inu, and all nations. Hi all the nations that came before us and those yet to become. An infinity of footsteps of those who long called this land home. The unfolding of bundles, the undoing of colonization, and the opening of this land to allow treaty to come alive. We affirm our relationship to each other and to the land. We acknowledge and pay respects to the indigenous nations and ancestors of this land. So hello. But overall, welcome. Uh, we're very excited about this project and uh, I'm very excited for those who are gonna be speaking to it. Uh, I believe she is here. So I would like to start by introducing Lori Ransom. It is my privilege to introduce Lori Ransom who has been serving as interim executive director for Kairos Canadian Ecumenical Justice Initiatives since January 1st, 2021. Lori is a member of the Algonquins of Pigbocknagam First Nation, who has lived off reserve all her life yeah, in Toronto, that. Ottawa, and Regina. Lori deepened her knowledge of and passion for the work of healing and reconciliation between Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples after being appointed as the first healing and reconciliation program animator for the Presbyterian Church in Canada and later as senior advisor, church and interfaith relations for the Truth and, Reconcili Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada. Most recently, she has served as a reconciliation and indigenous justice animator with the United Church of Canada. These are highlights of a rich history of reconciliation work. And it is my pleasure to introduce Lori Ransom. Thank you, thank you very much, David. Can everyone hear me? Okay, that's terrific. Um, yes, apologies for arriving just as we started. And when I conclude, I will be listening eagerly to my other panelists, but have to turn off my mic for a little bit. This is like, I have almost eight hours on Zoom today. So you'll forgive me if I eat lunch while, while this takes place. But uh, first of all, let me add my, my words of welcome to everyone to this webinar. Um, Kairos is, is absolutely delighted uh, to be, um, be hosting and hosting this project and this webinar on supporting migrant workers in the community during the COVID-19 pandemic. We'll be having bi-weekly uh, webinars now until the end of, of June. And so again, it's, it's great that all of you made time this afternoon to join us. Um, in this inaugural webinar, we're very pleased to introduce the project are empowering temporary foreign workers during COVID-19 project. Uh, the project just began just as we were entering 2021, just as we were wrapping, heading into the Christmas period, in fact, when we, we learned we had uh, received support for, uh, for moving forward. And it, it will run until June 30th. Um, pleased to note that the project is funded by the Government of Canada's Temporary Foreign Worker Program. And it's specifically designed to support foreign foreign workers in parts of the country where we have really established relationships, that being in the Maritimes in Ontario. Of course, as many as you know, of you know, Kairos is no stranger to uh, these temporary foreign worker communities. 
For 20 years, we've been pleased to build networks and to work to strengthen partnerships in support of labor rights and human rights. I've tried our best to accompany migrant workers to access legal support and address their other needs. And we're committed to bringing their precarious situation to the attention of all Canadians and also particularly to elected officials. Uh, for example, we organized the first national migrant gathering in 2006 that brought together migrant workers from different streams and sectors, from trade unions and, and other advocate groups. Our recent work has helped improve the living and working conditions of migrant caregivers. The goal of, of this new project, which we want to highlight today, is assistance to temporary foreign workers during the pandemic and with a focus on the agricultural sector. Kairos therefore is working with local partners that include the Durham Regent Migrant Workers Ministry and the Center for Migrant Workers Solidarity in Simcoe who are with us today and will be introduced shortly. We're also very pleased to partner with the Neighborhood Organization, which is also in Ontario. In Atlantic Canada, we're partnering with the Cooper Institute in uh, Prince Edward Island, with the Filipino Canadian community in New Brunswick, and no one is illegal, Halifax. Uh, we also look forward to anticipating collaborating with additional community organizations and service providing agencies as we continue to roll out the initiative. As mentioned, the Government of Canada's financial support, which I'm just delighted to say is at the level of $2.18 million for this initiative, is much needed, a much needed funding infusion for our partners and community organizations who until now, as you know, have been supporting migrant workers with limited means throughout the pandemic. We're all aware of the accounts of unsafe work conditions of underpayment, of inadequate housing, inadequate health care, uh, lack of access to legal and settlement services. These have been well documented. And we know that the COVID-19 pandemic has just dramatically worsened the situation. For migrant workers, increased isolation imposed by the pandemic makes finding and accessing supports they need from multiple service providers just that more difficult. The project therefore is designed to address these difficulties. We're providing access to government information resources, to tutorials, workshops, and webinars to help temporary foreign workers learn about health and safety precautions related to COVID-19, the proper and effective use of personal protective equipment, hygiene and sanitation, and other related public health protocols. The funding we believe will strengthen network capacity to accompany workers in accessing services and benefits. This includes medical services as well as exercising, pardon me, exercising their rights and receiving direct services and emergency assistance. Finally, we're implementing a community coordinated approach, collaborating with stakeholders to improve and address the identified gaps and challenges to help increase the protection and safety of migrant farm workers and to minimize the transmission of COVID-19 in places where they live and work. These migrant workers are frontline workers. They're quite literally keeping the rest of us fed. They make deep personal sacrifices to come here to support their own families, including during these very challenging times. I can't thank them enough. Our own families could not love, live comfortably without these workers' contributions to our society. So we're especially grateful to them and to everyone in the farming community for all that they do. Thanks, David. I'm gonna turn it back to you. Thank you so much, Lori. Uh, and we are going to move on to Father Peter Chilella. Uh, born and raised in Hamilton, Ontario, Father Peter joined a religious order where he was trained to be a missionary to serve migrants, the Scalabrinians. Sorry. He served in Colombia, the United States, Venezuela, and Canada as a priest for 22 years. In 2014, Father Peter began to serve in the Diocese of Hamilton. He worked with the migrant farm workers since 2009 and in Brant and Linden, Ontario since 2017. Father Peter provides overall oversight of, of the Center for Migrant Workers Solidarity in Simcoe, 
a community coordinated initiative to support migrant farm workers in the surrounding communities. And with that, it's my pleasure to introduce Father Peter. Thank you, David, and thank you uh, to the all the team members of Kairos and all the other partners for this opportunity. Just to share a little bit about our experience and in, in our part of the world where we're serving. I should add that um, the work that's being done has been going on, uh, uh, as it was pointed out. It's not that we're just starting something new. What is new, of course, is the, uh, the perhaps the reach, the scope, the depth, because of the injection of funding that'll help us to give more service. The area that we're talking about, basically, we, we're, the center is based in Simcoe, would be considered kind of like Southwest Ontario, uh, not far from, you know, Brantford, uh, going towards London. Um, and, uh, but the area that we're servicing is not just that local region of Norfolk. We also encompass Linden and, uh, and Brant. So as I said, the, the four main groups that make up this sort of partnership centered around the Center for My, uh, Migrant Worker Solidarity include uh, the Linden Migrant Workers Network, uh, the Norfolk uh, Representation Group. Uh, I, I work personally out of Brant in, in Burford and in Blessed Sacrament, that's sort of my home base. And then we also include, which covers mul uh, multiple areas, the Caribbean Workers Outreach. So we wanted to also give them some attention because most of us are primarily working with Spanish speaking and Mexicans, Guatemalans, uh, but we also saw the need to include that uh, representation as well. Again, all these groups working in different capacities, limited resources, but Thankfully, through the generosity of and partnership with Kairos, we're able to uh, continue our work and our service. In the past, we were able to do certain gatherings and services. Like in my church, we would do a religious service followed by a meal or fellowship. Of course, that's not possible right now because uh, they are uh, because of their congregate living. We, we need to be, we need to protect the migrant workers and avoid any kind of gathering per se. So we, we try to do things as best we can through Zoom, through WhatsApp. Some of the challenges, because not all the farms are necessarily properly equipped with Wi-Fi. Many of the men do have data, but you know, they're bringing their phones from Mexico. And so they have to also save their minutes uh, for their uh, talks and, in connection with their loved ones. Some of the projects that we're uh, gonna be embarking on, as I said, we're limited with the COVID, but something that we've sort of undertaken is this idea of providing a gift bank. So we want to welcome them, make them feel a part of our community, not just welcome them as workers, but welcome them as uh, vibrant members of our community. And each gift bag will include items such as PPE, masks, uh, sanitizers, uh, some toiletries, and some packaged food. And also, of course, information, our information, our contact information, and so forth, so that they can reach out to us. From that initial contact with the migrant workers, we hope to be able to build on that so that we can disseminate uh, a number of these resources that Service Canada has provided. And even for me, I've been doing this work for a number of years, it's great to have because, you know, sometimes you think, oh, well, these are migrant workers or special category, but reading the material, a worker is a worker is a worker. Whether the worker has a, a residency, a, a, a citizenship, or is here on a, on a temporary basis, they have rights. They have to be respected. They're not indentured servants. They're not slaves. And, uh, you know, in our experience, unfortunately, you see the, the gamut runs wide. You see those that are 
great and excellent and treating the workers with kindness, dignity, fairness. You see those that are, no, they do the minimum. They're okay. Nothing. They don't break any rules. Unfortunately, our experience has been more than there are a number, I don't know, percentage wise, but too many, unfortunately, need to, to improve uh, the quality of life and uh, the, 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 way, the way they treat the workers, you know, in terms of their fairness and, and remuneration and so forth. Then with COVID, that complicates things because they're supposed to be in isolation. Even there, there's misunderstanding because sometimes the guys are told, well, you're going to be in isolation, but you know, you have to pay for your food. No, the, the government has given each farm credit so that they, they must provide food for the workers while they're in that mandatory isolation when they first arrive. So our work as well, we're not, we're advocates. We, we of course, we want to help the migrant workers, but our work is also to work with the farmers. You know, we don't see them as the enemy. We don't see them as the bad guys, so to speak. We don't demonize them. As I said, we, we praise those who do the work and treat the workers fairly, but then we have to call out those who are not doing things properly. Now, we don't have any enforcement power. That's not in our purview. So what we will do then is if we see a situation that, call, that needs attention, then we will contact the local authorities like public health or uh, the labor board or so forth to bring that to their attention. And then they do the enforcement piece. And we do that because obviously we don't have that jurisdiction, that power. Secondly, those of us in the front line have to be very diplomatic. <laughs> like my own case, I have uh, parishioners, people in my congregation that are farmers. So I don't want to antagonize them, but I try to persuade and, you know, my, I could say generally the ones that are part of my congregation uh, treat the workers very, very well, fairly. But still, I won't be afraid to, to speak up if I have to. And when I need to, call in question and bring in the authority so that a certain situation can be addressed. So, and, and migrant workers don't cannot form a union. The law doesn't allow them to do that. And, uh, and uh, there was an article a couple of weeks ago, this gentleman representing the Farmers Association sort of said, well, they have the consulate office. If you talk at least to the Mexicans, they'll tell you they're pretty much uh, useless. This is their quotation, inutil, <laughs> no funciona. Like for the most part, you don't get a lot of back or support. Surprisingly, last year, Mexico finally did say something with the migrant deaths, but we feel that, you know, it, it shouldn't just be a tragedy that calls attention. You know, they need to address it before things happen. So this is some of the things we're trying to provide. We respond when we can. We work with our local uh, uh, agencies like public health. We have a very good relationship, for example, with the medical officer for Norfolk, Haldeman. He's a strong advocate. He's doing all he can. In fact, yesterday we had a training session with Dr. Shankar Nassathari, and he's advocating the government saying that the migrant workers should are frontline workers and should be in priority in terms of vaccination. So that was good to hear. Now, whether or not the government acts upon it, that's another story, right? But it's good to know that there are uh, strong community partners that are advocating. Other community partners include the churches. So like in Norfolk, we are very grateful for the local, for example, Catholic community, uh, families, uh, parishes, uh, Father uh, Murphy, Father uh, Dufermont, uh, Herman, I see is here as well, plus, and a number of people that have been doing this for years. So as I said, we didn't, we didn't just invent the wheel. It's been going on, but we're hoping that through this interesting collaboration, we'll be able to strengthen our, our, uh, our services. Uh, we've, co we've cooperated with one another in a loose way, but now with the center, we obviously, and because it's a grant, we have to formalize that uh, relationship. So we obviously, obviously have to do things according to certain procedures or standards because we, are, we have to make an account of what we're doing, how we're doing it, what will work, what works, what doesn't work. 
And part of that project too includes uh, being able to actually pay people. You know, usually we relied on hardworking volunteers, but it's good that we were able to actually get people, uh, you know, and, and properly compensate them because many of them are putting their their time, their mileage, their all their resources, and they'll do it willingly. But it's only fair that we we find the ways to support them as well. Other ways that we can also help is through our uh, translation when we're called upon. I know in my case, for example, when there was an outbreak at Scotland Farm, uh, I was called to visit the five installations and not only to bring the, the workers some care, pastoral comfort, but also to, to serve as an interpreter so that the, the news, the, that was the unfortunate news of Mr. Juan Chaparro Lopez, one of the three that passed away in, in Ontario last year. And we were able to do some fundraising for the family as well. Uh, very tragic and very sad. So our hope is that through through this injection of funding and through this, uh, you know, the termination of the government to really give us uh, the tools that we can uh, to work on these things, that we can avoid the tragedies of, of the past. Right now, currently, there is a group of 10 that are being housed at the Best Western in Brantford. They are chicken catchers. These are these are the guys that they don't come just for the season. There's a difference between those who come with a one, two year visa and those that come for the eight or nine months. They're allowing the seasonal workers the extra month. But these guys have been, have been here. And uh, so I believe a group of 10, one was COVID positive and the other nine obviously were exposed. So that's another way we respond. We do have a good relationship with the uh, hotel manager. She's very, very good at allowing us to, obviously we can't be in contact with them, but we bring them again, a gift bag, some information, some contact information, because basically they have to stay in the room. They can't leave. They're in the room, the food is brought to them, and they're under the care of the local, in this case would be the Brent uh, Health Unit. So these are some of the situations we've encountered and uh, in our ongoing work and uh, continuing service. So with that, I stop my presentation. If I don't know if you want to do the questions or after, I'll send it back to David. Thank you so much. There is so much to this issue. Uh, and I'm looking forward to uh, getting into the Q&A after our next okay. speaker. So thank you, Father thank Peter. You. Uh, our final speaker for this webinar is uh, Francine Burke, uh, another uh, partner in the project. So Francine Burke is the project coordinator for the Durham Region Migrant Worker Ministry, uh, the and slash <laughs> Durham Region Agriculture Migrant Worker Network. Uh, Francine was an administrator and outreach coordinator at the only ethnic specific AIDS service organization in Canada. The, Co the Black Coalition for AIDS Prevention of Metropolitan Toronto, better known as Black Cap. Over her tenure at Black Cap, she was instrumental in providing outreach services at community events year in and year out that would directly impact the African Caribbean Black community of the greater Toronto area. So now, Francine Berg. Oh, thank you, David, for that introduction. Um, hello, everybody. Um, so, a lot of what I was going to say has already been spoken about um, by Reverend Peter as well as by Lori. So that kind of shortens what I have to say, but nonetheless, I do have a lot to share. So firstly, um, as stated, I am the project coordinator for the Durham Region Migrant Worker Ministry, as well as the Durham Region Agricultural Migrant Network. Um, and I work along with the team. So as we all know, the best of our work is not done um, individually or silos. I have a great team that I work along with and we we all work together cohesively, which is my um, Reverend Augusto Nunes. Some of you may be familiar and have worked with him before. He is the pastor in charge at St. Savior's Anglican, Anglican Church. 
Um, and he is our the pastor in charge for Durham Region Migrant Worker Ministry. Um, there's also Elizabeth Espinoza, who is our Outreach and Direct Services Coordinator, um, and Christina Gomez, who is our Rural Workshop Facilitator. Now, the best thing with um, all of us put together is Reverend Augusto, Elizabeth, and Christina both fluently speak English and Spanish. Um, so, que habla espanol. Um, for myself, um, I'm actually fluent in English and in French, um, and I'm from a Caribbean background, so I am well-versed in all Caribbean dialects. So that's where our services um, get used and are best applicable um, to understanding where our migrant workers are coming from and also being able to relate to them. Um, just it's a matter of meet them where they're at so it's you can speak your mother tongue you can speak your dialect you can speak whatever you're comfortable with and able to communicate with us efficiently no judgment um so the partner agencies that we work with one of which is kairos um and Lori did a, a thorough uh, introduction of kairos so i won't repeat that um however we also work with another a consortium of other agencies of partner agencies, which is including the neighborhood organize the neighborhood organization, which is located in Toronto, um, Blessed Sacrament Migrant Worker Ministry, Center for Migrant Workers, which is covering North Hamilton, Norfolk, which is Port Rowan, Hallamandan um, County, shores of Lake Erie, South of London and Hamilton, and also Friends of Linden, uh, which are present, um, which is located covering Brantford, Langford Conservatory, Linden Friends of Migrant Workers as well. So with us, we're also a faith-based mission. So as a ministry, approaching our objectives with a form of supportive and positive supportive and faith-based approach, which is understanding the faith that has been a lot of the foundation of what the migrant workers have come from with their upbringing, but also it's a matter of their, their sole support while they're here and abroad doing their migrant work. So understanding that and having that being um, part of our approach um, has also been very, um, sorry, has also been very ad an advantage. And it's it's something that works very well because understanding that while going through um, these current times that we're living in, nothing um, is more sacred than your faith and keeping your faith and being able to speak with somebody that understands your faith and where that's coming from. So we're able to integrate both the support work along with faith to provide additional support services for the migrant workers. So just very briefly, um, the background of Durham Region Migrant Worker Ministry, as well as Durham, Re Durham Region Migrant Agricultural Network um, was unexpectedly founded in 2013, where there was a group of individuals who came together in response to the need for migrant workers integration into the community. In 2014, the ministry became official and it's in unincorporated network of organizations that care about the quality of life for migrant workers while they're away from their home and family and country of origin. So our mission and vision is working co collaboratively to create barrier free access to culturally sensitive quality health and social service for migrant workers in Durham region, in which we house uh, for migrant workers solely over 15 farms. Um, so we're seeing a vast number of migrant workers that are here, especially specifically from Mexican and Caribbean background. So our values are equitable and inclusive, responsiveness, social justice, and health literacy. And we understand in our current times how crucial this health literacy is, and we ensure that we're providing that information and knowledge to our workers. So in that aspect, how do we do that? Um, we provide information and support about local health care, human rights, and social service to workers, and social services to workers. Um, myself and Elizabeth do, do both have um, social service worker background. So that's another advantage that we want, our, we want the workers, the operators, as well as the supervisors to take full advantage of understanding that we are more of a one-stop shop in regards to the support services that can be obtained. Um, providing in opportunities for social interactions. In the past, Reverend Augusto has had such things as sports days um, to keep that interaction going. As we all know, um, football or soccer, however you want to uh, name it, is something that is a common pastime. So bringing that social interaction in place to just just to allow the mental health to just to support one's mental health, having those activities. We do know that these workers are working 
profusely over extensive hours continuously and having that social support is necessary. Um, and we are literally in the planning of how that's going to take place in these current times. But one thing I can tell you with myself, along with our team, we will make it happen some way, somehow but it will happen. Um, so advocating for micro migrant workers, providing education opportunities on migrant workers for all community members. So to be included in the community, we also have to um, advise and educate the community members of the fact that migrant workers are in their community and to make sure that they're treated justly and fairly. Creating awareness of migrant workers in the Durham region for all community members as mentioned and provide a forum to obtain feedback and implement suggestions based on feedback. We can only go forward when we include everybody in regards to what we're doing and how to progress and that's the best way for advancement. So our the countries that we have for our seasonal agricultural workers out here in Durham is Anguilla, Antigua and Barbuda, Barbados, Dominica, Grenada, Jamaica. We have a lot um, from Mexico, Montserrat, St. Kitts and Nevis, St. Lucia, my home country of St. Vincent and the Grenadines, and Trinidad and Tobago. Currently, we are actually... Oh, sorry. Um, uh, we're currently working on the solidifying the contacts with the operators and the supervisor for the farms. Um, there are some years where that changes in regards to especially supervisors. If that has changed hands um, in regards, usually it's a main or a lead contact of one of the farm workers. Um, that could be one of our point of contacts as well. Um, we do provide the delivery of welcome bags um, that is also supported through um, Kairos. Um, and we also ensure that we're including informational material in there, which is provided by Service Canada in regards to protocol, in regards to following and adhering to those protocols. We include snacks in there and toiletries. Um, beneficial to us in Durham region, there was um, put out by Durham Health, Public Health, uh, a section 22, which adheres that we have to have culturally specific food included, which is, it's an amazing thing to know that you can get that these workers could get culturally specific food um, for themselves. Um, we've delivered winter clothing for workers as well. We can only imagine we we can endure the cold, but imagine being from a southern continent in which this is not your normal weather and to be working outside for anywhere from eight to 16 hours a day in these temperatures, we're ensuring that the clothing is available for them. So creating and delivering support modules, providing personal support, counseling, self-care and wellness activities, as I had mentioned, by providing outreach to, to commonly frequented locations. So we make our outreach, not just solely to the farms because we know that's where they'll be, but how about we go to the grocery stores where they frequent, where they do their groceries on a weekly basis, whether it's a Friday, Saturday, Sunday, we know which grocery stores they frequent. We also know that remittances are part of a reoccurring schedule of a task that needs to be accomplished. So we're there. Sometimes some workers may not be comfortable if we're speaking to them on the farm, but if they're speaking to us outside, there's no limitation to what that conversation would be. And as Reverend Peter spoke about collaborating, we're currently also collaborating to provide Wi-Fi at bunkhouses through internet providers um, because that's needed. I don't think anybody could imagine that your spouse has gone away to work for eight months. And especially with the quarantine that needs to take place, they come here, there's no data. They're not able to tell you that they arrived safely. There's no communication. And furthermore, imagine quarantining for 14 days with no contact with anybody on the outside, no family, no anything. So we wanna make sure that there is stable and sufficient Wi-Fi available in all the bunkhouses, including the quarantine bunkhouses. So with our past experience with migrant workers and community outreach um, within our team, we have the unique skill to provide personal and confidential support while knowing how to navigate efficiently, efficiently so that we don't cause any concern or bring any attention to the workers. So that's why we also ensure that not just doing outreach at the farms, but doing outreach to the locally frequented areas um, is so crucial to us. Um, I did see a question pop up, but I will leave that for the question period, the Q&A, um, to respond to that, but I did see it. Um, so that's it for me, David. Um, go ahead from there. Yes, thank you. Thank, thank you so much. So why don't we start with the question that's already been asked as people start preparing their questions. So uh, what are some other recreation and fun activities uh, that you've come up with, Francine? 
Okay, so as we mentioned, football has been something that has taken place. Um, I always say one of the benefits is that I grew up more of a tomboy. So I've already started sourcing cricket bats um, for cricket um, because that is social, that's a socially distanced sport opposed to the batsman and the catcher, which we could adhere to that. Um, making sure that when I'm doing the visits is that I have cards, that I have dominoes. Um, I've also inquired in regards to building looty boards that can be at each bunkhouse. Um, those are Caribbean pastimes that are, are just staples and just understanding of how that can also help. Um, one thing that has taken place, place is there is a fiesta that Reverend Augusto would have um, at least twice in the summer, which is just a, a, a large, just as we know as a fiesta, if anybody doesn't know, just a large gathering of the migrant workers and support workers, um, having a dinner, having some fun time, a little bit of music, and just ensuring that we're doing that, but from all aspects as well. So having, we could have a fiesta and then we could have a fish fry, which is uh, more of a Caribbean, um, and it is what it sounds like, um, but includes a lot more than that. So bringing back what is culturally specific and bringing that into a, a way that eat, everybody can learn about each other's background and culture, but also inc including that in a way of a recreation and a fun activity. Um, I've done... I'm a person, I also make costumes for Caravana. So even if it's a matter of bringing something like that into place, having a fet, having a line, um, those type of aspects, getting that going so it's not just they're stuck at the farms and there's no social activities, keeping that interaction as well as from an educational basis. I just, just to add, uh, you know, again, with COVID, and there are those limitations of the gathering. So in brand, of course, we would have our, monthly gathering because we have the facility and the space to provide the, uh, you know, home cooked meal, which the guys always appreciate. I know Norfolk and Simcoe, they used to have a tradition of doing a soccer tournament, a, kind of like a picnic or a day, an outing together. So right now what we're looking at, like Francie was saying, is bringing them the supplies, whether it's cards, uh, soccer balls, whatever, so that they can do that recreation maybe on a on a smaller scale. I know sometimes I've received donations of bicycles and that's another uh, well welcomed uh, tool because many of them do live in isolation, even in, in literally like, like they're they're outside of the town. So and, and not all of them have the license to drive. So the bike is a, is a great way for them to for recreation and also to be able to go to the local store to buy something. So uh, we have a question from Marissa. So uh, is there a way to find out which farms employ migrant farm workers besides word of mouth and farming networks? Um, and is there a specific contact at embassies or through other networks um, recognizing that there are privacy issues in this? Yeah, that's the problem. Yeah, that's that's uh, that's something we've tried to look into, and it's word of mouth because uh, we can't, uh, you know. Even when I when I first arrived to this area, I said, "Well, I see the farm, but where where's the office? Or where's the building?" So even there, it's a little bit hidden, you know. And then you find out, oh, it's over there. Okay, it's in that concession road. It's just legwork. You uh, the privacy issue. You can't just access that information of the farms. But, you know, the, the migrant workers are pretty good. They'll share. So we, we built up a bit of a network ourselves. Like in Brent, I'm on a, on a social media WhatsApp group, which includes almost uh, about 150. So I'll, I'll ask the guys, I'll say, hey, if you know anybody or any other, you know, new arrivals, please let me know, contact. So word of mouth is still a, is, is a big tool for us. But yeah, we there isn't a database that you can just access and, Oh, there they are. No. Sorry. Uh, so very quickly for ourselves, um, just to further in regards to what Reverend Peter said. Um, so that is something that that's how it um, it works out in Durham uh, area as well. But what I've been doing, 
as I'm new in this role as well, is creating a database in regards to the operators, the contact, their preferred form of email or contact, right? Um, and having that so that we understand how that works and we have those contacts and just with the common understanding that that would be shared only with um, migrant worker ministries or networks um, throughout Ontario or throughout Canada. So they understand that um, that's how it would be shared and also getting their consent to do that prior to, but hopefully this isn't a, a roadblock that we'll have to continue to face in the future, um, just with that common understanding. Yeah, D David, perhaps I could just add on that question that we have imp information on Cairo's website about the organizations with whom we work. So to try to get an idea of, of who's working with, organ with migrant workers, uh, people can access that list and in that way find out, you know, where people are, are located. Um, and Jamal has mentioned also uh, freedom of information requests being uh, a useful tool uh, that they've used in uh, Quebec as well. Um, so we have a question from Selvi. Um, so in PEI, they're working on ensuring all migrant workers have access to health care and get a health card. Uh, there are also efforts for safe housing. Uh, what are your experiences and thoughts around these essential services for health care and housing? Anyone want to take it? Easy, easy question. <laughs> yeah, like I said, it, it's it, it varies. There, there, there is a standard. There is a, an inspection. Uh, for example, in Norfolk, they have uh, rather large farms and groupings. They call them bunk houses. I don't know if people were aware of the, some of the controversy because of the the tight space that they live in, and. Uh, you know, some of the, the difficulty is that when the inspector goes and sees these bunkhouses, they're, they're clean, they're pristine, because they're not occupied yet. <laughs> so they'll go in the off season, check it out, say, oh, everything looks good. But, you know, when you put people in there, things change. So, uh, yeah, unfortunately, even Dr. Uh, Shanker was saying that I really feel they have to move away from those bunkhouses. They're just not, not humane, you know putting 40, 50 guys in a, in a very confined space, even, even if they meet this basic requirement, it's not, it's not humane. So uh, there are those that do have decent accommodation and some are pretty, you know, pretty good, but again, it, it varies. And this is the problem is who enforces it, who follows up on it. Uh, you know, right now it's really up to the individual farmer. But, uh, you know, like I wanted, I just posted a, a link to an op-ed where I say, you know, really the government has to step up its plan and, and be more proactive in that regard to, to make housing uh, a priority. And, and when there's been an outbreak, this is, this is the result. We know that, like our nursing homes. We know that when there's a, a weakness in the system, the virus exploits it and it just magnifies it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Connie wanted to uh, respond to the previous question as well. So, Connie. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much. And thank you for the question around, you know, getting more information where the farmers are and, you know, uh, how many workers they are employing. Because we are supported by the government of Canada and they really wanted us to succeed in this project, uh, they promised that they're going to provide us with the list of, you know, uh, farmers and employers so that we would, you know, it would help us uh, be able to reach out to them. And as Father Peter mentioned before, the, the, the community, you know, uh, groups who are already have connections with farmers. Um, this, is, this also helps in terms of getting, getting that information and getting, you know, uh, referrals to other farmers. 
the other thing that I would like to share is the fact that we have relationships with uh, consulates of sending countries. So we have relationships with, you know, the consulate of Barbados, uh, Jamaica, and other Caribbean smaller countries so that they let us know if, you know, um, some of their workers are needing immediate assistance and also um, just having that, you know, open communication so that we can both be responsive to the needs of the workers. Uh, so I just want to, yeah, put that out there. Thank you. Thank you, Connie. There was a question about whether uh, any of our partners are working with uh, chicken catchers specifically. Yeah, I think the, the group, uh, the group from, from Linden. Yes. And, um, they are working with uh, Guatemalans. Yeah, we're going with Guatemalans, but also they have been meeting with, uh, yes, with this uh, chicken catchers. Yes. So the person probably to contact is, uh, it could be Ella or Richard. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, they have an outbreak right now. Mm -hmm. I, I explained that to them. So I, I wanted to add, I forgot to mention names. So you already saw some other faces. So Fanny Lokoski is the director of the center. Eliseo Martel is part of the Linden Group, but also he works with uh, uh, the Grand Erie Clinic. Ella uh, Haley is part of the Linden uh, Friends or Network and Langford Conservancy. So these are some of the key people that, and then Reverend Le Lennox Scarlett, uh, and uh, and Diane are representing the the Caribbean outreach. So those are so, as I said, we we're not an organic group of uh, of ministry or service providers, but we're learning to work a little bit more uh, interlinked, a bit more because of the, the the nature of the of the project and the program. Um, um, speaking about uh, the farms. Uh, uh, the other day we went uh, we went to Google and then we Google um, farms from uh, Brandt County, Norfolk County, Haldeman County, and we there is a list and um, uh, there was a lot of farms and most of the farms in this area hired migrant workers. Uh, now last night I went to see a group of. Uh, people in Jarvis, Haldeman County, and they were from, um, they work at Pro Plant, and they were from uh, uh, Vietnam, and some of them are from uh, India. So we are working, we are getting workers from different countries, and um, they were very pleased, and they are very happy that all these groups are joining forces and um, they are very, they, they appreciate the work is, that is being done. And I think they were in quarantine, Ella, Ella. <laughs> they were the ones that were in quarantine uh, in Brantford and they were very, very grateful with the welcome bags. So it's, it's, it's very important, very important um, to keep, keep up with the work everybody's doing. Thank you so much, Fanny. Um, there was a question about uh, whether we were working with or in contact with any groups in Leamington that uh, Sylvia could get in touch with. Um, we can also, uh, anyone is free to respond in the chat as well. Um, and we have a response to that question as well. Uh, Fanny, there's a question about whether you know if there are any, oh, do you know what languages the worker from India speak? Well, um, is some, some of them from India, well, they, when I spoke to them, they, they spoke English. <laughs> uh, young, very young guys, and they spoke English, um, and the, the girls from uh, Vietnam, they, um, they spoke little English, but we were able to communicate. And uh, I guess Vietnamese, 
yeah, some of them can understand, mm -hmm. but uh, they are kind of practicing. But one of them, yes, yes, yeah. And the other ones, they, I talked to them and they were speaking English, um, but I don't know which, which language. I think yeah. it is Tagali or that's yeah. the main language. Tagali or Indian. Um, there is a question uh, regarding Connie mentioning uh, the federal government providing lists of farms uh, to participating organizations. Uh, does it include names or just the number of employees? I hope we will, you know, we will get the, the names, the contact information and where they are located. Because what we're asking is not just in Ontario, but also to support the work of our partners in the Maritime. So basically, uh, farmers, employers in PEI, in Nova Scotia and in New Brunswick. Yeah. This is uh, Roland from uh, a Filipino Canadian community of New Brunswick. Can you guys hear me? Okay, yeah, so um, we were shared with uh, information from, uh, from Canada, from a website, one of the websites of uh, IRCC, uh, a list of uh, employers that anybody could, uh, could look at. So I don't know if that resource could, uh, could be useful to you guys. So it's a list of um, uh, LMIAs that issued to employers. So we have, from, for New Brunswick, we have about, I think, 400 of those. But those are, those ones are issued from, you can get back as 2018, 2017. So we're assuming that some of the uh, TFW that uh, came in 2018 is not PR yet. So they could be part of this program. So I will I will put the, uh, the, the in the chat room here, I will put the, uh, the site where we get this information. Uh, so you guys, uh, you know, uh, it's it listed up, uh, up, you know, all over Canada. So this is the one that we're, we're working now, our team is working now in New Brunswick is to uh, identify, um, uh, you know, a uh, geographical location in New Brunswick so we can uh, kind of uh, segregate it uh, so we could, uh, when we go to one place that we could um, pinpoint a strategic uh, uh, location where we can, uh, we can give away our uh, welcome bags or welcome uh, information that we have. So. Uh, guys, uh, check it out. I know that uh, PEI is also using that that uh, that site. So, unfortunately, it's only it's only up to uh, up to uh, a Q3 of uh, 2020. So, anybody that uh, there's no Q4 there yet. So that's why I'm hoping that uh, Q4 will be out uh, sometimes. But I think Q3 and maybe Q2 also is also a way for us to uh, identify. Uh, which uh, which employers so who are the employees that are employing uh, 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 migrant workers? So you guys, uh, if you guys uh, want to check that one out, uh, we we we, we took out whatever's in New Brunswick, and that's what we are looking for now. We're sending an email to them, but we try to uh, uh, contact them uh, by phone, and also contact uh, initially in the community. I think that's the best way that we have. So last weekend we went to uh, uh, you know uh, Sediac and. Uh, uh, when the concentration of uh, TFW in New Brunswick and uh, we, we work with the community to identify who could be a contact for the community, uh, whether they are from, uh, you know, from Mexican, from Jamaican or a Filipino uh, uh, temporary phone workers. And, you know, we, we got some of those and we're just waiting for our welcome bags to be processed so we could uh, go back to them and uh, give those, uh, uh, give those uh, necessary uh, PPE for them um, and we're also working with employers so we have a couple of employers now that we're in talk to uh, to meet uh, you know it just it, it's going to be a very diplomatic because you know uh, they're saying they're not affected but I said you know um, we have two kinds of uh, service that we can offer them one is to, to get the PPE and, and the other one is if, if, if they become uh, you know affected by COVID-19 so yeah so you guys uh, check it out and maybe you can find it useful uh uh, while we're waiting for the updated data from Kony, I, I guess, you know, uh, that one would be better. So thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I have a couple questions from Gabriel, but first I saw that uh, Jean had her raised her hand. Did you have a question that you wanted to ask? 
Yes, I just wondered what this, the possibility of uh, vaccinating uh, the people, especially those who are in such uh, tight uh, accommodations is. How soon are they likely to be? As I said yesterday, we had our conversation with Dr. Shanker from uh, Norfolk uh, Haldeman Health Unit. They're asking the government, but it's, you know, in this in this era of uh, shortage of vaccination, you know, that it's a political issue. So unfortunately, uh, and rightly so, the, the seniors, uh, the most vulnerable, but I don't know if, if the migrant workers are gonna necessarily be given a priority. Uh, it's an ongoing discussion. Like Dr. Shanker even mentioned uh, prisoners, they're a vulnerable sector as well. And, uh, but who's gonna advocate for them, you know? So nothing has been explicitly pronounced by the government. I, my sense is I'm maybe a little bit not so optimistic <laughs> I think they'll be getting it with the rest of the general population. I don't see a, an urgency to, to get them vaccinated beforehand. A whole lot arrived today, apparently, or at least was uh, a whole lot was uh, approved. So, thank you. Thank you. And a link was uh, just put in the chat from Jane, uh, migrantrights.ca slash vaccines for all. So um, it's good to see that there is a push for uh, vaccines for migrant, uh, migrant workers as well. Uh, so there was a great question from Gabriel that I wanted to get to. Um, what can you tell us about uh, the mental health of the farm workers one year after the pandemic started? I, I want to invite Eliseo, if you're still there, could you, uh, you, you dealt with them on that level as well, if you wanted to comment about the mental health, Eliseo? Yes, uh, we usually, because we provide clinical services to the workers and we implement a survey on psychological distress to the workers, just to learn how they are doing mentally. And what I can say is that in general, what, you, what we see more regularly is more cases of depression and anxiety. And the reason of depression is to is really feeling far from their families, far from uh, working with the children in their decisions, and also being a, a father or a parent with the couple and the partner in, in, in their own country. And the anxiety comes has mostly to do when there are issues with the family in their home country. Mm -hmm. They feel this anxiety of not being able to participate, to collaborate, to support, etc. But also, uh, sometimes the working conditions and the relationship with co-workers is not necessarily the best situation. And that also uh, uh, triggers these feelings of anxiety. Something that also I can say is that when we were looking at the result of this survey, we have done that for three years. And, and looking for stress, the level of stress is not that high. And probably one of the reasons is because they come to Canada with this mental attitude that you, are, you come here to work, to be far from your family, and that's what you do here. And that's what it is. And so for us, it was a little surprising because we were thinking that considering the, the weight of the work that they do and sometimes the working conditions and the condition and the hours of working of this work in some areas that can be up to 12, 14 hours per day, we were expecting a much higher level of stress. And so we didn't find a, 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 a high level of stress among most of the workers but something that we believe is because they also come from also very dire conditions in their own countries. And so for Latin Americans to move to Canada, life in a way gets some kind of compensation. Let's call it that way, okay? I'm not using any professional language here mm -hmm. because coming from uncertainty, delinquency, violence, exploitation in their own countries to Canada, 
then that level of uh, facing those daily situations is lower. However, they still need a lot of support in regard to mental health because also the tendency from the workers is to deny mental health conditions. Mm -hmm. and, and it's interesting because sometimes you go to the, and this I'm not talking about only the Mexicans, I'm talking also about the Caribbean community that we know. And what is interesting is that you ask them about uh, addiction and alcohol, alcoholism, etc., and 99 point, point to 99 will say no we don't have those problems but when you visit them in the farms you will see people around tables with full of bottles of beer so the reality is probably that that's one way for them to relax and the question is if that becomes then an addiction we we don't know we haven't we haven't been able to reach that level but we know that uh that they many of them probably will drink alcohol and con but also keeping their working condition because they need to work so it's not that they pass out and they are not able to work not for them work is the priority but certainly mental health is something that they need for sure but the way to address the mental health component has to be thought a lot because if you openly talk about it the the reaction will be i don't have a problem i am fine and yeah. then they will start with the dialogue and then you say, oh, i think it's also the insecurity right because they don't want to present themselves of having any kind of sickness or concern for the bosses yes. because they want to be able to work and they want to be able to and the other thing is be called back that's the anxiety mm -hmm. so yes. they're very highly motivated workers, but sometimes to their detriment, unfortunately. Yeah. And so just to, to add a little bit is also the something that uh, increases the level of anxiety is the relationship with the farmer. And a common comment from the workers is some farmers are very, what will be the term? Let's say that they do this. They come with some orientation about what they need to do with the crop, just to say something. And then two days later, he comes and tells them totally something, something totally different. And uh -huh. then he, this farmer start talking to work and saying, "Why did you do that? I'm telling you to do this, etc." And so some farmers, in their behavior with the workers, uh, they are. A, what will be the term? Maybe abusive can be the term. Demanding, abusive. Demanding, yeah. sometimes abusive. demanding, yeah. not yeah. considering what they were letting the workers know, etc. And that uncertainty about what the farmer is going to let them know tomorrow creates a lot of anxiety among workers. Yeah. Thank you for your, your input on that, Elisea. Thank you, Elisea. Um, I have a question from Reverend, Reverend Diane Everett. Hi, I was just curious, I guess mostly to uh, Peter and Lori, but to really anyone about if you if you were happy with the article on the front page of the Saturday Star a couple of weeks ago about the confidential uh, probe uh, done by the Ontario Coroner's Office into the death of migrant workers and that the confidential aspect of it is is uh, problematic, I guess. But I don't know if you saw that. But I, if you did, I was wondering if you were pleased with the investigative reporting from the Toronto Star. It's right on is, the front page. So is that from Sarah? Is that Sarah, the the writer, Sarah um, M? I don't I don't know how to pronounce her last yes, name. Yes, uh, yeah, Sarah yes. Majta Desda and Rachel yes. Mendelson. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I, I'm not familiar with that piece. Sarah was in contact with me a few weeks ago because she needed some information. So I, I wasn't. I, I told her to give me the heads up about the publication. But uh, she and her uh, fellow writer are. If, if it's from Sarah and her writer, I'm sure they do an excellent job. They they have been the ones that have been really bringing to light a lot of the problematic and and Sarah mentioned to me that she felt that it was all this kind of secrecy because usually when there's an inquest 
into a worker's death, it's public. It should be in the public domain. And I don't know the reasoning why the government is kind of this, this veil or guarded secrecy. But I do know that uh, on the other hand, they are taking some of the, I don't want to give specific example, but I know that there was an interview conducted about a worker who had been abused uh, verbally and other which way. And they had a very uh, lengthy interview with him. And from what I understood, the worker was very pleased that they were listening to him. And these were people from the provincial labor board that really wanted to hear his story. So I don't want to always say that the government's doing nothing, no. Uh, but it would be nice to hear what are they doing so we can be informed as well. Thank you. Uh, for yeah, I was, I was pleased, I mean, to make it on the front page of the Saturday Star, it seems as though there is a lot of interest in, um, in the, all the work that you are all doing and in this uh, real human rights issue. So I, I think to make it on the front page of the Saturday Star is really great. Yes, I, I agree with you, Diane. I did see the article and I did read it. I thought it was a great piece. I think they're asking the right questions. Um, as Peter says, there, there could be some reasons about that are important confidentiality to the individuals involved, you know, and that would be the only reason for any kind of, you know, not making it public. But I, I sure hope that some kind of summary report is available that explains what happened and why so that we can learn from it, because um, that's the critical part. So thank you for it was a great article. Thank you. Uh, sorry, just very quickly, I actually shared the article link in the chat for everybody to use. So if you copy it and put it on your clipboard, you can have it for later reading as well. Thank you. And, and one thing I, I um, uh, with the COVID-19, uh, many workers um, get anxiety when they get sick because they don't want to report the sickness to the employer. They want, they are afraid to lose the job, uh, and I had to uh, a worker last last uh, year in Limington, and it was the wives that were in, in touch with me all the time, uh, because the 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 one the wife was worried that he was going to die, but the worker kept uh, kept telling her, "Don't call anyone, don't call anyone." Uh, so um, so if a worker calls, please. Uh, we uh, what I did is I called the health department in Windsor, so they will monitor uh, the worker. Uh, that's the only thing we can do, and um, he was fine, but he was he ended up in the hospital. But it most of the cases is anxiety of losing the job if they get sick. Reporting that they have a cold or they have a cough. That's yeah. There is a lot of anxiety. Mm -hmm. Um, I have another question here from Gabriel. Uh, do you know if the negative test that Canada is asking before they take a plane or the hotel quarantine restrictions are affecting the arrival of more uh, migrant workers? I, I was told by someone that uh, the workers have to have a test seven, I think 72 hours before arrival in Canada. And some of them, uh, once they get to the airport, test positive. And then they are, they, they won't be able to board a plane to Canada. Mm -hmm. So that is affecting, uh, Daisy, I think you have a case. Someone told you, right? Yeah. Uh, Morgan yeah. Henry. Um, that um, in, in Mexico they test they they uh, they test them is the is the worker um, uh, is result positive they are no um, aboard the plane and they back home. Yeah, yeah. So, so some workers are arriving at the airport and and they test positive so they cannot um, get to Canada so it's creating a problem. Um, so an updated piece on that, if I can very quickly, is that because there are in certain countries, especially within the Caribbean, a shortage of tests available, what they're doing is they're allowing the workers to arrive 
Um, they will be tested upon arrival. They will then be brought to the safe bunkhouse that has been mandated um, and quarantined there. If their test results do come back positive, uh, public health will contact them and they will have to further quarantine. However, they do have something in place and that's been outlined in regards to that for temporary workers. So the same protocol for regular entry is not applicable to um, temporary workers for that understanding of what is available from what isn't available. Oh. And I'm trying to find, if I can find that, um, that documentation that I had received, I will share that in the chat as well. Uh, and I have a question from Tara. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Does the government impose any regulations and standards on the farms employing migrant workers and are they sufficient? Could there be many legislations that, uh, could there be any legislation that could help you? There, there are standards, there are, uh, uh, you know, certain uh, protocols. The problem is uh, there, there isn't the follow-up, like, uh, as I said, like, for example, an inspector will come and look at the living condition, health inspector, but they'll inspect it when the guys are not there. So it looks like a very clean <laughs> place. So the, the difficulty there is how do you enforce it? And uh, I think with COVID, they are taking a little bit more steps, but of course, there's always room for improvement. I, I just wanted to add some more information around, you know, the question on, uh, additional regulations and also in terms of, you know, uh, the strict uh, regulation for incoming uh, workers. Um, as part of, you know, this project, we have this regular consultation or check in with uh, the government, uh, bringing to their attention what we're hearing from the ground in terms of the issues, challenges and, and urgent, you know, uh, cases. Um, as friends, well, first of all, um, we've heard of the challenges many migrant workers in their countries of origin are facing with regards to getting, you know, the, the test 72 hours before they board the flight. Many of these workers are coming from remote villages. So to go to the center to get, you know, uh, the test and also transportation and accommodation and food, uh, this, this is very expensive for them. So we brought that attention or issue or problem to uh, the government and they are working with uh, local governments in, you know, in the countries where the workers are coming uh, from to make sure that you know the workers are not paying for this uh, for the cost of these additional requirements. So that is good news. The other one, uh, these additional restrictions or measures that's coming up. This is going to be effective March 14th. And Francine, I think this is the one that you're referring to. Um, so starting March 14. Uh, all international travelers, especially temporary foreign workers, uh, they are going to be tested upon arrival and will be brought to a government pre-approved uh, quarantine accommodation for three nights until you know, they get the results from uh, the test they, they, they took upon arrival. Uh, there's also going to be, you know, enhanced airport services to make sure that these workers are supported, particularly around the issue brought up uh, on connectivity, like a cell phone data connectivity so that they are able to connect with their families and be able to connect with local, you know, community partners while they are on their 14th. 14 days quarantine. So these are being looked at and we are also sharing this information to partners so that we are all sharing the same and accurate information. With regards to regulations, um, Father Peter, if you remember, we had this conversation with the farmers and they said they already had a lots of regulation in place or they've been, you know, they're being regular, regulated heavily. Mm -hmm. I think the problem again rests on the ability of the government to to implement and you know uh, monitor and make sure that 
these regulations are being followed up and, and make sure that, again, uh, the workers uh, that these employers or farmers are, you know, um, have, uh, would have the much needed protection to ensure their health and safety. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for that, Connie. Um, and we have a question about which specific government departments you're in consultation with. This is, you know, uh, this is Service Canada or ESDC slash HRSDC. Um, so that's the department that, you know, uh, have a full oversight of the temporary foreign worker program. And that is also the department uh, that we get the funding from. Uh, and I have a hand from uh, ADDBD. Hello. Um, thank you for this webinar. Um, okay. I'm, uh, my name is Marie. I'm here on behalf of the Association for the Rights of Household Workers. Um, we work more so uh, in terms of legal and policy we don't we haven't um, ever done some groundwork but as of Monday we will be applying for a grant uh, which will be which is part of an initiative to help uh, the promotion and, and exercise of rights of migrant workers um, in times of COVID and so it's we don't know if we're going to get it at all but um, I was wondering for those of you who have uh, been working on the ground during this time um, if you had any, any tips, any insight, our, our perspective will be to um, raise awareness and, and uh, about their rights uh, and um, in general and specifically in times of COVID. So if there was any insight as to uh, what we should be focusing on or um, any, any tips or anything like that. Um, yeah, I can answer that. So what I can do is for the information that we received is specifically um, for uh, Service Canada has made it, I do understand that Quebec does have their own body of government. However, just the understanding of um, in regards to COVID-19, freedom of movement, um, there are some publications that I have received that are in English and in French. So that can just as easily be shared with you. Um, I'll just put my email address in the chat um, so that you could that we could correspond from there. Um, and I'll look into any other further information that would be helpful because it's also a matter of being able to navigate the information that um, that needs to be shared, but also the understanding of sharing the information that won't become problematic. Because um, we do all know the rights. We all do know about freedom of movement. That's against the Charter of Rights. However, also taking into consideration when you're working with operators that are not in conjunction or in alignment with those, those freedom of rights, how that can become problematic. And that's the last thing that we want to end up happening. So we can um, definitely be in contact. I'm just typing in my email right now. And we can have a conversation. And we could just correspond in regards to sharing that information that's the most beneficial to them. I like that question, by the way. <laughs> And I would like, I need to go, but before I'm leaving, I will, I have a comment for you. Uh, you are from Quebec, no? Are you? Okay. You know, I think the situation has two dimensions. One is the right that they have, they are entitled. And it's always good for workers to know about those rights. The other dimension is how, if they have the freedom and the power to exercise those rights. Because if you just provide the rights, it's like a, giving a person a recipe to cook something. But if you don't provide the kitchen or the stove to cook it, it doesn't matter how many pieces of meat, raw meat do you give or whatever, because the person won't be able to do the recipe. So probably something that I will advise you to your organization is to work on those two folds, is to learn about how do they exercise those rights? Do they have the control and the power to do it and the rights per se? Because if the 
amount of control and power that the, the, the worker has is very, very little. To know the rights is just one more point of anxiety and stress because they know that they should, but they, they cannot. So that will be my, my invitation. Something that is interesting, for example, in, in Ontario, they have the right to health and health care. And they receive the OHI card, the, the health insurance card from Ontario. So they are entitled to health services, but all the health services close at five o'clock. So when they are out of the, the farm, all the offices that provide healthcare are closed. So it doesn't matter if they get the car, if they cannot use it because where they have to use it is closed. And so I will invite you to look into those situations because if you provide the workers the information about the rights, but also how to exercise those rights without fear of uh, retaliation, that probably will be a big plus for the workers and for your organization. Yeah. Anyway, so I have to go. This has been thank really you, good. Sir. And thank you, Kairos, for organizing yes, this. Thank you. And so wishing you a good uh, weekend. Eh? Thank yes. you, Alex. Yeah. Take care. Thank you for your input. Yes. Uh, Eduardo uh, included in the chat um, a document um, in regards to uh, from the Ontario Ministry of Labor uh, about their inspections uh, and the kinds of inspections they're uh, conducting on farms as well. Um, so that is quite useful information as well. So I actually wanted to add something and oh, okay. the irony of everything is that Gabriel Ramirez just actually po like just posed the question in regards to um, what I was going to speak on. So for myself um, and for our team uh, with the, the diversity of languages that we speak, um, that increases our ability of communication. Now, the one thing that I'll say is that I'm a person that I feel everybody should always work in teams and work as a consortium. I don't think that one person should ever have the skill sets and not willing to share with others. Um, with that understanding, communication can always be a barrier for differences in whether it's uh, dialects, whether it's the language altogether, whether it's, I mean, there's Spanish, there's Portuguese. I mean, it's a matter of what you understand and how you're able to communicate. So one thing that I can put out there for myself is that if there's any language barriers um, that do come about that are any of the languages that I speak, which I mean, officially it's French, however, um, Caribbean dialect is another one that not everybody is able to understand sometimes um, in communication. And also it eases conversation with workers if they're able to communicate more freely, knowing that the other person understands them. So if there's anything, I mean, it's always a matter, you can always just reach out to myself. I put my email out there. Um, and that's open to everybody for use. Um, we also do translation of all of our documentation. Everything that's posted on our website um, is also available in Spanish as well for that same reason, understanding the diversity of Mexican workers that we do have out in Durham region. So if at any time there's any documentation that may have been received, especially um, of any sort that needs to be shared with any migrant workers that do speak another language and you need any assistance on that. I'm not a professional translator. However, I can, I read, I speak, and I write French as well. So that's not an issue for me. Um, and I think that that's something that all together we could work on collectively just to enhance our communication skills. I don't have anything else. So th I mean, it was a very rich discussion and a lot of good insights from uh, not just us, the panelists, but other contributors. I did also post uh, my uh, contact uh, email. So again, like Francine said, we're always willing to share and learn. And, you know, we're, we're sort of, uh, this is a new uh, chapter, I think, for us in terms of the, the program and the service that we're providing. So if you, that's why everything is kind of uh, new in a sense. I mean, there are things that we're used to be our um, ministry, our service that we've done before that we're trying to adapt with uh, with the pandemic. But uh, definitely this, the we just started. So we just started in January and we're not even into the throes of it, thick of it yet. 
because m many of the workers haven't arrived. But uh, but uh, again, thank you, uh, Kairos, for the for this uh, for, uh, some webinar and allowing us to share and and also learn. And uh, David, I just say, well, I can hang around for a little while longer. I don't have to move quite yet, but I will have to leave around 10 to 3. Um, first of all, just a great delight to meet my fellow panelists, Francine and Peter. Um, I've been hearing a lot about the great work your organizations are doing, but we had not yet had a chance to meet. And like many who meet in these times of pandemic, we meet over Zoom. So lovely to put faces, names to faces um, and to hear a little more about uh, about what you particularly are focusing on. Um, I think, David, the, the benefits of a webinar uh, like this are self-evident in that the community present clearly has a lot of knowledge um, and has been sharing that today. And that's been fantastic to see and really appreciate everything that people have put in terms of resources into the chat function. And yes, Kairos is, is very much you know, concerned about issues like vaccination of the migrant communities. We're concerned about that with respect to all of the communities with whom we work, whether that's the indigenous communities, whether it's our international partners and others around the world. We're you know, trying as best as we can to keep up with rapidly evolving information in this regard, but you know, have no fear, we will be advocating to make sure that, that these vulnerable communities have access to, to vaccines you know, as, as quickly as possible. But again, just, just really delighted to, to listen in this afternoon and, and to be a part of this discussion. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, and we're seeing quite a few great resources being put into the chat at the moment. Um, Connie, I'm wondering if you wanted to uh, speak as we sort of head into our closing as well. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much, David. And thank you to everyone who joined the webinar today and to our community partners who are doing uh, great work, great work, and really, you know, reaching out and, and providing, you know, that support and, and welcome to the migrant workers, you know, to our brothers and sisters who are coming here to work. Um, I echo uh, what Laurie said in terms of, you know, this webinar being uh, a form, uh, platform for sharing information, getting educated and so forth. But I want to add that this should also be a platform for, for action. So, so you're not off the hook yet. <laughs> like I would really, you know, want everyone to, to get engaged, you know, like, we, uh, the Kairos website, particularly the Migrant Justice webpage, e e Empowering Temporary Foreign Workers, uh, would have the list of our partners on the ground. And we encourage you to connect with, you know, with those partners, with our partners in wherever location you are at. So, you know, not only learning things through uh, webinars or online, but also being informed hands-on. Uh, I know that there, you know, the COVID restrictions are still in place, but there's there's other, you know, uh, ways of being able to do that. Um, the welcome bags are very, very essential in terms of providing, you know, the immediate uh, personal protective uh, products and tools to to protect workers and other essential, you know, items, or we call it treats. So if you can provide some donation, if you can drop off some, some of these materials or products to the centers, that would be very, very much welcome. Um, we also don't want to forget about our advocacy work. Uh, already mentioned, you know, uh, advocating for the workers to get vaccinated is very important. They are part of the frontline, you know, the sector of frontline workers. And we also don't want to forget about our, you know, advocacy for permanent residency. Uh, yes. Problems that we've seen in the past and continues to see, primarily it's because of the status of the workers. Not all workers might want to become permanent residency, uh, permanent residents, but they have to have that option. 
and there should be pathways, you know, available for them to become permanent residents. So I, I mean, I, I, I want you to, I want to encourage you to participate, get active, and get engaged. That's my yeah, parting words. Thank you so much, and we look forward to having you again at the next webinar. Thank you so much for that comment. Thank you. Thank you. And I want to say thank you for Kairos for um, setting up the center. Uh, and this is uh, it, it is very important for migrant workers to have a place to say to call home. And 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 that was very that it is like they are very happy. I'm sending the workers um, the flyers and um, and they are really happy and they are eager to come and see the office. And uh, I think this is an excellent opportunity for them to have a place to, to come and talk to the families on WhatsApp because sometimes you see them on the street trying to, to you know, communicate sometimes in October, November when it's really cold. They are like by a window trying to get on WhatsApp, use Wi-Fi. Uh, so this is, is, is really important. Uh, to have this office for the workers. So thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks so much, Fanny. Um, I was told that you can save the, uh, the entirety of the chat if you're looking to collect those resources. So if you click on file, uh, you can save it to a variety of places, um, and there are quite a few excellent resources in the chat, so I encourage you to do that. Uh, our next webinar is going to be on March 9th. Uh, we're still in development of that workshop, but a number of uh, topics that we're looking forward to presenting are mental health uh, tips for migrant workers or how best to support mental health of temporary foreign workers, uh, as well as what exactly the process is at the moment uh, in terms of arriving in Canada um, and the sort of uh, uh, updating that process so that we are, you know, keeping ahead of the, the changes as they come. Uh, I would like to once again thank Lori, Peter, and Francine for uh, for presenting and all of the knowledge from everyone uh, engaged in uh, this discussion. I've learned quite a bit <laughs> and it sounds like everybody else has as well. So thank you very much. I, I had uh, just a question. I just put my hand up. <laughs> oh, okay. um, uh, I, I didn't uh, actually see who was speaking um, to the current process with Caribbean workers who were um, being able to arrive in Canada without um, COVID testing. Um, and uh, whoever that was that was speaking to that, as I said, I didn't actually um, see the name, uh, said that they were going to perhaps provide some communication around that, um, that they had received. But anyway, I, I, I just uh, wanted to know how widespread um, that uh, practice was. Um, so that was myself, um, okay, Francine Burke. Hi. Yes. Um, so I had message in the chat, but I'm just realizing it went to all and didn't go directly to you. Um, so I will, I had put my email address in the chat, just resend okay. the message to you. Um, and if you could just send me a quick email, and as soon as I find it, I could um, make sure that I share it to you. Okay, that's and, great. Great, Francine. Thank you. The chat's pretty busy, but I'll look. Yeah, that. that is true. That is true. So I'm just trying to find out for you. Yeah. Hello, it's good to see everybody. Uh, for someone who's been involved in this work for the last 20 years, this is amazing. To see this many people from so far across Ontario and across Canada gather working on a common cause. I see Tom Sager, whom I've known for years. We used to meet in Toronto at the, uh, the award dinners. Fanny, who has been around forever. Uh, uh, Guadalupe is sitting in the back, and 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 Daisy is is behind uh, Fanny. Uh, Eduardo was on for a bit. Alfredo Barahona. Next time, we'll ask him to bring his guitar. Uh, 
it's amazing to see so many people so dedicated. I recall, I recall that you uh, you sang at a it was a mass in at Saint Bernard's where you where you sang, and it was just amazing. Hello, Eduardo. Good. What is all this growth on your chin, buddy? <laughs> no, it's been, it's been a few years. I think yes. when I knew. <laughs> yeah. See, Bonnie so nice and see Bo you. Bonnie and Bob Drago, my goodness gracious, you people have been around forever. Yep. <laughs> it's wonderful. Hi. And Michelle. Hi, and Michelle. Yeah. Hello, Michelle. Hi. Hi, Herman. Hi, Miss. Hi, Hi Nancy. <laughs> Great to see you all. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. So, good luck and God bless. And see you in March. We are too, truly doing. God's work. Just for everyone's information, this is the Simco group. <laughs> <laughs> the Simco group, no, it's not. <laughs> no, like, you know, not. Simco, Brandt, Linden, and Burford. Uh, yeah, so they know each other, and it's so, you know, each other, and so nice to, you know, to be connected to all of you. And yeah. Finding you know, having that center set up not only provides a space for the workers, but also for advocates, you know, mm -hmm. uh, like us. So it's it's great. And everybody's more than welcome to come and visit us. And we are located at 37 Kent Street South. So I'm just going to send a message uh, with the address. So you guys are more than welcome to come over here and, and see the office. It, it's, it's really nice. <laughs> but yeah, I would like nice. actually to yeah. say that with, if not for the COVID restrictions, uh, we, you know, we need help. Uh, tomorrow we're going to be going to the center and stuffing the welcome bags, the, 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 uh, the products, you know, that we want to put in, in the bag were delivered, delivered already. And so tomorrow we're going to stuff the bags. And if not because of COVID, we would welcome you to come to the center and help us. <laughs> yeah. Just want to repeat what Herman said. It's great to see so many good uh, familiar faces. But it's also great to see so many other new faces all across the country. So it, this is the work that you guys have been doing for many years. So you can see the fruits and the results of the seeds that you've been planting. Yeah. Yeah. And, you, and we can all feel good that this is going to continue. So thank you so much. And I really look forward to seeing you uh, in March. Very good. Closing, closing comment. The lovely lady sitting alongside of me is my wife, Barbara. We got married last year, January, and uh, she is a veteran of social justice, uh, Kairos, Development and Peace, uh, Catholic Women's, and uh, happy to have her with me. <laughs> yeah. Hello, Tom. <laughs> no. Hi, Tom. Nice to see you, Tom Sager. We go way back, too. Thank you, Barb. Nice to see you, too. Okay, we'll say our goodbyes and <laughs> we'll meet again in March. All right, everybody, take, take care. care. Nice to see everybody. Right, I take care, everyone. Thank you, Francis, for your presentations.